I'm speaking quickly on the subject, the iniquity of sin. Our objective is to understand the iniquity of sin. And our second objective is to know what to do about the iniquity of sin. The scripture makes it clear that sin goes beyond offending God with our actions. Many times we think that sin stops by offending God with actions. There is the iniquity in the sin. Sin is the primary offense. While the iniquity of sin is the secondary effect. The iniquity of sin refers to the collateral damages and ravages of sin. Particularly its effect on others. I will take one example. So there is the iniquity of sin. There is the primary offense and the secondary effects. Let's take David for example. In every of the services we shall take an example of one person and then the effects of their actions. Second Samuel chapter 11 verse 2 all the way to verse 5. He said, and it came to pass in an even tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived. And sent and told David. And said I am with child. And David sent to Joab saying. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent to David. And so forth and so on. I'll, I'll talk about that later. Now the primary sin was a sin of loss, the immorality that David wanted. That was basically what he wanted. But the other things David saw were not things he planned for. Am I communicating? The effects that followed, it, it was not in his budget. That is called the iniquity of the sin. The ravages, the damages Number one, the woman got pregnant. He wasn't planning for pregnancy. All that he was looking for was maybe what they might call fun time. He wasn't planning for pregnancy. And then he asked the, the husband to go, and go home from the war battlefield so that he can go and have relationship with his wife and camouflage it so that nobody knows who owns the pregnancy. The man said, no, I am in battle. I can't go home. Long story made short. I'm sure you know the story. David walked with Moab. Uh, uh, sorry. Joab. The commander of the army. And sent Uriah the Hittite to the forefront. That was Second Samuel chapter 11 verse 15. Let's look at that. And sent him to the forefront. And he wrote in a letter saying, Set ye Uriah the Hittite to the forefront of the hottest battle. And retire from him. That he may be smitten and die. Wow. Number one. A woman got pregnant for him. Number two. He is committing murder. That he did not plan for. All he wanted was to sleep with a woman. Now the woman is pregnant. Now the woman's husband must be killed. And it hasn't stopped yet. Thirdly, when the woman's husband was killed and the woman finished money for her husband, David sent and married the woman. That was not part of the plan. Second Samuel chapter 11 verse 26 to 27. It wasn't part of the plan. And when the, and when the wife of Uriah the Hittite 
heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. She mourned for her husband. And when the mourning was passed, David sent and fetched her to his house. And she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that he had done displeased the Lord. All he wanted was immorality. Now he got a pregnancy. Now he got somebody killed. Now he married a woman he wasn't planning for. Ay, 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 ay. It's called the ravages and the damages of sin. And then from there, God sent the prophet to him, Nathan. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 14, he said to him, How be it, David, by this your deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto you shall surely die. Are you seeing consequences? First of all, woman is pregnant. Secondly, David kills a person, the man after God's heart. He killed a person. Thirdly, he has to marry you. Bathsheba. Fourthly, he said God's name is being reproached by your action. That is the empowerment of the enemies of God. And the empowerment of the enemies of God. He said you have empowered God's enemies because you represent God to your generation. By this your action. He said, David, it is possible that you can hinder somebody from coming to God by what you have done. You see, there are many of us in the offices and places where we work that certain actions might stop people from going to church because of you. And finally, consequence number five, generational calamity. There are things that people do today and they wonder tomorrow how their, their seed is not able to survive and succeed. Look at what he told him in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9 to 12. Wherefore thou hast despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. You have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Mm. That is called the iniquity, the ravages, the damages. He said, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus said the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lay, lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will did this, do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Ay, 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 ay. Can I ask you a question? When David started, did he plan for this? All right. See the ravages and see the damages. His action implicated his children. Implicated his next generation. Am, um, what do you call her? Amnon loved Tamar. And sent for Tamar and raped Tamar. And Absalom heard that his sister has been raped. And Absalom went and killed Amnon. The sword has started. The seed, the harvest has started. The flow has started. The ravages have started. And Absalom ran away from home. And Absalom returned back home. And the father received him. And then suddenly Absalom rises up against his father. And then Absalom laid the mat on the rooftop. And slept with ten of his father's concubines. In the sight of all Israel. According to prophecy. God had forgiven David, but the ravages continue. The damages continue. For example, 
When a robber, the robber, the thief, carries somebody's bag, all he wanted to do was to steal. He had no other plan. Maybe he's planning to take money from, from the bag. But inside that bag was an international passport that has an American visa or a UK visa. Inside that bag was a phone with very important contacts. Inside that bag was an important document, crucial document, that this person needed to apply for work and be admitted by the next day. And the thief takes the bag. First of all, what are the, the iniquity, the sin of the thief is the stealing of the bag. But the iniquity of the sin is the pain and the hurt that the bag owner feels. How many of you know the pain of loss? You have ever lost anything before? It doesn't matter whether that thing was important or not. There is the pain that you lost something. The, 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 the sin of it was... The stealing of the bag, the iniquity of it was the pain cost the owner of the bag. The iniquity of it was the pain and the hurt of trying to get another American visa, trying to get another British visa, trying to get another thing. And then the, 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 in, the, the iniquity of it further is the pain of the loss of opportunity. Because the document he needed to get job the next day was inside the bag. God said to the thief, I would deal with you for stealing. And I would deal with you for the pain you caused. Some of us think that it just ended with just I stole something. No. He said, what you stole caused some effects. It caused some pains. It caused some ravages. You see, I believe that an understanding of a thing like this will help humanity how to behave. Somebody, another example, lady stands up to try to take somebody's husband. First of all, when they were getting married, maybe 30 years ago, 25 years ago, where were you in the equation? When they labored and built themselves for 20, 25, 30 years and grew themselves, where were you? Suddenly, you appear and you love a man whose wife maybe doesn't love him, if you think so. You are better for the man than his wife. Listen to this. And then, you step into the house to divide the house. There is the pain, the, the joy that was in the home. The, 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 the strange woman steps there to ruin that joy. She steps in to deny the woman the joy of her husband. Making that woman to live perpetually in tears. At times turning that woman into a shadow of herself because, because I have seen many women who are victims of strange women. Most of the time there is that loss of confidence, that loss, that inferiority complex. Is it that I am not good enough? What did I do wrong? And then you put such a pain. The self-esteem is gone. Then you, you hijack. A, a, a lady was calling a, a woman from the, the hotel. He said he carried the, hus the, woman, the husband's phone and was calling the wife with her husband's phone. And she picks the phone and says, it's not your husband, I am the one. I want to let you know that he is with me. And until you beg me, I will not release her. Release him. Those are the Jezebelitan Delilahs of this generation. Go they can go to any extent. Now, the children are deprived of their father's love. They are his presence. And they are denied the opportunity of having a marital model. They don't have a model marriage anymore. 
because someone steps in to destroy that and then the children have the potential of a future dysfunctional home because they haven't seen any example growing up why one woman with one percent of her body the reproductive system is only one percent of the body surface pursued a man and ruined the destiny god said your sin is adultery your iniquity is the pain you have caused and i will deal with you for all of them am i communicating at all is this making any sense at all i give you a third example the example of a killer i say it all the time maybe there was a political situation and the man wanted a post and or oh, somebody say help me kill somebody now i tell you a story i was with in my office one day and a man met me he said he was employed to kill the opponent of a, a politician and the, the bill was five million or something and he he killed that opponent they gave him three million first and he returned back for the balance of his two million and the man doesn't want to see him again He's carrying police escort. He's doing everything. You can't see him again. Say, look, you are owing me two million still. And the man didn't because he has already achieved his goal. And this killer went after somebody that is precious to that man's life and wasted the person. And he called him. He said, I have started. You still have to pay me my money. Whoosh. When he started, he didn't plan for that. He didn't plan for that. Sin is a chain reaction that leads to iniquitous outcomes. Ravages and damages. Am I communicating? That killer rendered a woman a widow. Turned the child into an orphan. Turned the mother childless. Turned a friend, friendless. And some dependents who depend on this man for school fees and all that, he turned them into destitutes by one action. God said, your sin was the killing, the mother. But your iniquity is the multiplied pains you have caused and the psychological trauma you have given to people and the, and the consequences that people have suffered because of your wickedness. Is God speaking to someone here today? There are people who lack confidence in any human being's love because of a wickedness perpetrated by a killer in their eyes. There are those who live in psychological, emotional trauma and fear because of what they had experienced. Because of somebody's action. And God said, for what you did, for the primary thing, the sin of killing, I will deal with you. But for the consequences of it you caused, I will deal squarely with you. Beloved brothers and sisters, this is where it bothers you. Exodus 34 verse 7. Exodus 34 and in verse 7. He said, the Lord is keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. That is, if the man does not come for forgiveness, he is visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children. Unto the third and the fourth generation. There are people suffering today because of parental wickedness of the past. You say your father, your mother wickeded so many people. Pardon the use of that word. You say I visit the iniquity. That was what happened to David. He said because of what you have done, sword will never leave your house. Your children will kill each other. The way Absalom killed Amnon. See, that is what we call generational curse, ancestral curse. At times, it is a product of generational iniquity. So, beware how you behave today. You can't break a home and expect your children to have a home. Ay, 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 ay. Even yourself. 
You cannot take people's joy and expect that you can have joy in your generation. Never. You cannot take smiles from the faces of people and expect for you to smile all your generation. Never. You cannot. You cannot give people stress and give people distress and expect yourself and your generation to have stress. What is more, you can't be torn in the flesh of your generation and not have tons in your flesh multiply. What you attack, you can never attract. Is God speaking to somebody here? But that is, what, that, is what, that is why you are here with your family. So that we can appeal to God if there are generational iniquities to be dealt with. This is my counsel as we round off. What do you do regarding iniquity? Number one, confess the sin and its iniquity to God. The sin. We already read Psalm 32 and in verse 5. I acknowledged my sin unto thee and my iniquity. Do you see? Have I not hid? I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Somebody sent me a text message yesterday night and I looked for it in my phone as if he knew the subject I'm about to preach on. He said, sir, I have been stealing, taking people's phone, taking everything. He said, but now it is fighting me. He said, my life is closed. Nothing is open. He said, please pray for me for God to have mercy on me. Confess the sin and its iniquity. Do you know the meaning of that? The sin is, Lord, I am sorry for stealing. The iniquity is, Lord, for the pains I caused. Have mercy. I didn't just steal, but I caused pain. Lord, I am sorry for trying or Trying to take somebody's husband. But, not just that. The pain I caused. And have mercy. Many times people just confess sins. And they ignore the iniquity. And God is saying, what you did was worse than stealing. You didn't only steal. Somebody may have committed suicide because of your action. Number two. Seek forgiveness. From people you may have hurt or caused pain by your actions. You seek forgiveness from them. This is the realm that they call restitution. In James chapter 5 verse 16. He said confess your faults one to another. So there are faults to confess. I'm sorry. And pray ye one for another that you may be healed. People that you consciously, deliberately hurt by your action. Maybe you kill them, slander them, lied against them, whatever. And they felt the pain of it until they are struggling to forgive, confess them. Now, let this be done with caution and wisdom, this particular one. There are people that you hurt who may not be aware that you hurt them. They are not aware for any reason. For example, a man who kills somebody. Except by the leading of God directly. It might be very dangerous. To go and say I was the one who killed that person. To the family. Except if he wanted to surrender himself to the police or something. Am I communicating? Except he wanted to do that. But you went into someone's home. To cause destruction. You go to the people and say I'm sorry. You lied against your boss in the office until they demoted him. I am sorry. That was what Zacchaeus said. He said, anybody I wrongfully defrauded, I will not only give them what I took from them, I will give it to them with interest. I will restore fourfold. That was Luke chapter 19 verse 8 to 9. Task collection is my job. And there are people I defrauded. I will return back to them four times. That was number two. Number three. Always consider the likely consequences of your actions before you act. Always consider the likely consequences. Let me say of your potential actions 
before you act. That is, this step I'm about to take, what is the impact of it on my neighbor? Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 it says, Come let us reason, reason, reason together. Say the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Let us reason. Let us reason. When mentality is engaged, iniquity can be expelled or escaped. Reason. Reason. Just think small. Think small. You need the money. The other person needs it too. You take one life only because you want to take, or only you want to take a hundred million. And then you waste a whole life. Look at the family. Look at the people, the dependents. Think small. Just think a little. Push the woman out. Push everybody out. Take the man to yourself. That is a yeshious mentality. Think a little. Don't think from the legs. Or think from the genitals. Think from the brain. Think a little. Always consider. Number four. That is the likely consequences of your potential actions. And number four, always consider the impact of your actions on your neighbor. Impact on your neighbors. Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. Whatsoever you will that men should do to you, do even so to them. Anything, the way you want people to handle you, handle them. Would you want somebody to take your bag and take your certificates and take your documents and render you and put you in distress? If you don't want, don't touch another person's own. Would you want somebody to castigate and lie against you and, and, and then paint you black and then you look like a demon? If you don't want, don't do it. If you're a young lady and you're unmarried, when you get married, how many girls do you want to pursue your husband? And if you don't want any girl to pursue your husband when you are married, quit. Leave that man alone. Just consider what, what is my impact. As a father, the, and I'm going to talk about many things today. The way you are dealing with your wife and giving a very wrong impression of marriage to your children. What do you expect of them? Just think a little. Consider the impact of your actions on your neighbors. And finally, always apply for the grace of God. The grace to stand firm in uprightness. Apply for grace. We live in a generation where if you fail to apply for grace, you, may, you, you can be grounded. Apply for grace. We live in a generation where you don't need to look for sin. Sin looks for you. Apply for grace. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Father, by your grace alone I can live. And by your grace alone I can stand. I apply for that grace. I believe it's a new day for somebody.